Good morning. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to our kickoff event for our latest series, Public Policy South Metro. I'm Anna Stinson, Director of Programming for the Bloomington Chamber. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of housekeeping notes as we get started. Uh, your audio and video are muted as you enter the webinar. You can use the chat feature at the bottom to communicate with uh, staff if you have any issues. Uh, use the Q&A function at the bottom for questions for our legislators and panelists. And also note that we are recording this session and it will be available uh, after the event in uh, via email. We will get that sent out to you. As I mentioned, this is our first uh, in a series, a new series for us here at the Chamber, Public Policy South Metro. We'll be holding the series about six times a year and uh, to talk about issues related to Bloomington and the South Metro in general. So I hope you will join us for future events. We are pleased this morning to have our Bloomington legislative delegation with us to give us some information and preview on the, on the session they are in. We are also joined by our moderator, Robert Freeman, who is the government relations manager at Health Partners. He also serves as the chair of our Bloomington Chamber Public Policy Committee. Robert, I will turn it over to you to get started and uh, let you take it from here. Well, thank you so much, Anna. I really appreciate the uh, introduction and um, appreciate all the legislators who could join us this morning. And it looks like we have a couple more that are coming in. One, two, three. I'm just counting, uh, counting your uh, faces on my little Brady Bunch screen here to uh, see who's here. So it looks like we're still missing one person. All right, well, um, thank you so much everyone for joining us this morning. So um, as I said, we really appreciate everybody being here. Um, it's exciting to see, you know, session has kicked off now the, for 2021. Um, we have our Bloomington delegation with us. Um, and we should start by just asking uh, each of our legislators to uh, just take a three, four minutes to present their perspective on the session uh, and what their personal focus and efforts will be on. So with that, let's start with Senator um, Melissa Wickland, since she was the first one to join us. Well, good morning. Um, thank you, Robert. And I'm happy to be able to be here today and uh, be a part of this forum. Um, and I think that we, we all look forward to being uh, able to be in person again at some point and um, wish we could do that. But um, it's great to be able to be here virtually and um, have a chance to hear from you and, and hear what your questions are about our session um, now that we're just a couple weeks into it. Um, I am Melissa Wickland. I uh, represent a uh, large part of Bloomington and then part of Richfield um, in Senate District 50. Uh, my committees this session, um, this biennium, um, are the Health and Human Services Committee, um, where I'm the, uh, the Democratic uh, lead on that committee. Um, I'm also on the Human Services Reform Committee and then also on the uh, Technology and Reform Policy Committee. Um, so I think a lot of the time and my priorities will be uh, revolving around um, the, the health, healthcare, um, health programs, and human services programs that um, take up a, a large part of our state budget. And a lot of, um, a lot of people are top of mind for people um, right now with the, the COVID pandemic work that's going on to try and address that. So uh, my, my key priorities are uh, definitely addressing the COVID um, pandemic. Um, we are heavily involved in um, looking at how the, the vaccine rollout is going and going to go. Um, we're very uh, highly limited in the number of doses we're receiving from the federal government right now, but um, there's a lot of work going on uh, to ensure that we can ramp that up as quickly as possible. Um, I definitely want to work on economic uh, responses to the pandemic and how we can help um, mitigate the issues that a lot of um, a lot of people have been facing due to the economic impacts of the, the, the virus. Uh, work on the budget. Um, we will be starting next week. We'll receive the governor's budget and then uh, the two um, caucuses will roll out their budgets later. Um, not until later in, in March. Um, and um, local issue, issues, I'm carrying the bill to uh, uh, 
postpone or repeal um, sales tax for the Bloomington Fire Station 4. So I hope that that's something that we'll be able to move forward um, this session that will help Bloomington. And also working on the I-494 35W um, uh, PAC, which is um, looking at how to best um, ensure that the, the first project that goes forward with that um, money that was allocated a, a couple years ago um, suits and, and helps Bloomington and Richfield out um, the most possible. A couple other issues that I are important to me are childcare and I'll be working on um, legislation to, to try to assist our childcare providers. We, we know that that's a, really a key to um, getting our economy going is, is having providers so parents can work. Um, they've been under a lot of uh, pressure and stress um, over the past year. And uh, so there's work to be done in that area. Um, on the technology committee, we will be looking at things like um, cybersecurity and um, IT um, policy. And so I'm, I'm very, I'm looking forward to that as well. So I'll stop there and look forward to your questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, let's go to Representative Mike Howard, Michael Howard next. Thanks, Robert, uh, and thanks everybody who's who's joining us today. Uh, this is going to be a, a very unique legislative session uh, for a variety of reasons, and front and center uh, absolutely will be responding to the pandemic. Uh, and I really see that in, in a couple main ways. First and foremost, our priority is the health of Minnesotans and uh, preserving uh, uh, life. And, and saving lives. And there's things we need to do very quickly uh, in that vein from uh, approving resources to extend uh, uh, homelessness shelter dollars uh, to keep people safe, our most vulnerable safe, um, continue to roll out uh, vaccines so folks can get vaccinated um, and a variety of things. And secondly, uh, you know, we need to protect the economic security of Minnesotans who have unfairly uh, been hurt by this pandemic. Uh, and uh, there's things that we can control uh, and there's things we can't control with this pandemic, but we can control uh, how we're helping Minnesotans weather these economic storms. Uh, and so things like housing assistance, childcare assistance, um, uh, aid for our small businesses, which we've already done at the legislature. Um, we need to continue to do those things to help Minnesotans weather this storm. Uh, personally, uh, I'm serving on housing and preventing homelessness, a new committee and we'll continue to focus efforts on uh, how do we uh, respond to, again, what's happening right in front of folks with the COVID, but also recognizing we faced an affordable housing crisis uh, before the pandemic began. Uh, I'm also serving on taxes this year and uh, look forward to being part of the conversation about um, how our uh, tax structure, how our budget represents our values. And uh, on that front, you know, we are facing uh, a challenging budget scenario. Um, I would say that our, uh, while our job is, one of our jobs is to balance the budget this session, our priority is to protect the economic security of Minnesotans and especially those that have been hurt by this pandemic. Uh, so I really uh, will be someone this session who's guarding against our, our past budget mistakes, things like cutting our schools, borrowing from our schools, cutting local government aid, hurting our communities. These are all ideas that I expect to come about during this session uh, under the guise of tightening our belts. Uh, but what we really need to recognize is that some folks have performed quite well uh, economically during uh, this uh, pandemic, those at the very top large corporate uh, entities, uh, but our small businesses, our families, so many are struggling. And so we need to have a conversation about uh, who, who's, who's hurting and how do we help those and, create a fair and, and just budget. Uh, so the, there's a lot to do, a lot in front of us, both right in front of our nose and long-term, and it'll be our job to kind of balance both of those things at once this session. And my liquor store has performed quite well. Uh, let's go to Representative Elkins next. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks everyone for, for showing up, up this morning. And uh, uh, I'm Steve Elkins, I represent uh, House District 49B, which is kind of Western Bloomington, Southern Edina, and small portions of uh, Eden Prairie and Minnetonka as well. And I'm uh, serving um, pretty much the same committees as last time. I'm the, uh, the vice chair of the local government committee. 
uh, also serving on the Commerce Committee, which has, and among other things, has some jurisdiction over healthcare insurance. So I have some initiatives in that area. Uh, and uh, working with Robert on some of those. <laughs> and uh, uh, also serving on state government finance, which oversees the budgets of the uh, um, state constitutional offices and a lot of the state's administrative uh, agencies. Uh, and of course, transportation. Uh, and uh, we'll be very active this year on uh, helping uh, Chair Hornstein pass a, a comprehensive uh, transportation finance bill. Uh, I'm very concerned about making sure that, uh, that MnDOT has adequate funding in particular to uh, uh, build out the plan projects to uh, reconstruct 494 uh, 35W interchange, uh, the additional uh, MnPass lane on 494 itself, uh, making sure that our bus rapid transit lines, the orange line and the, uh, 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 I know what colors are not, is not the, uh, the one that will be on Chicago Avenue will ending up at the Ball of America uh, as, as well. So I'll be very active on those. Uh, we'll actually be carrying bills that, that would allow cities to uh, implement uh, street improvement districts, uh, dropping a bill that would allow cities and counties to implement local option gasoline sales taxes to help uh, fund local, local street networks. Uh, and we'll be introducing a, a bill that would start uh, assessing a, a mileage uh, tax on electric vehicles uh, in place of the current $75 electric vehicle uh, um, surcharge. So I expect to be very active in uh, this year on in transportation, on uh, making sure that uh, both uh, local and state uh, and, and both road and transit uh, um, operations are, are adequately funded. Um, my background, as most of you know, is uh, uh, you know local government, uh, information technology, transportation, healthcare information technology in particular, and so I, I tend to you know seek out uh, niches that seem to be overlooking overlooked that uh, where I can I can bring my life experiences to, to bear, um, and so. Um, among my other major initiatives, the one I'm work, working with Robert on is uh, you know, improvements into the, uh, the, the, price, the pricing transparency in the healthcare industry. Uh, healthcare is the only, uh, only thing that we buy where um, we're uh, um, expected to uh, uh, purchase the service before we know how much it's going to cost. And, uh, and these services frequently costing uh, hundreds of dollars. And, uh, so I, I don't think that's right. So uh, I've got a couple of, actually a, a collection of three bills moving together that would make the cost of healthcare much more transparent to, uh, to, to healthcare consumers. <laughs> I've taken on the issue of, uh, of consumer data privacy. I think the residents of Minnesota should have the same kind of privacy protection, uh, protections that residents of Europe or residents of California enjoy right now. Um, so I'm very actively involved uh, with both the uh, IT community, the business community, um, uh, the ACLU and other consumer rights organizations to uh, see if we can pass a, a bill that's even better than the one that's in, in California related to consumer data privacy. Uh, and then uh, also working, uh, you know, very actively uh, and, uh, and uh, Representative Howard is a uh, uh, one of my co-conspirators on this. I, I, I'm very support, um, supportive of the, his efforts to uh, you know, supply um, you know, greater funding for affordable housing in the state. My, I'm working more on the uh, institutional uh, barriers to affordable housing, building up on my long experience as a city council member, housing and redevelopment authority commissioner, met council uh, member. Uh, and so I've been able to see, you know, and identify, um, you know, barriers to the construction of the of relatively more affordable housing by, by the free market. And uh, I've come up with a couple of uh, very controversial, but th th apparently thought provoking uh, uh, proposals uh, around that area. Uh, but I, I think some of them, the discussions and I've had, you know, um, meetings two days in a row with the uh, Municipal Legislative Commission, which is most of the, the, the wealthier, composed of most of the wealthier suburbs around the, and the Twin Cities. Okay, About, uh, pause, let's pause there because um, that's been yeah. five minutes and I want the other two people. Yep. Uh, let's go to our Representative Carlson next and just introduce yourself and tell us what you're going to be working on this session. You're on mute. You'd think by now I'd 
you know, be on top of that. Um, well, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, good morning, Robert, uh, Bloomington Chamber. Thank you for hosting us today. Um, I'll be brief kind of in my opening remarks. Uh, a lot has already been said, but um, I'll kind of take a higher level approach. Um, as you may recall, uh, House Democrats revealed their first priorities for the 2021 session uh, in a press conference last week. And it was all about making sure that we give back to the Minnesotans uh, who have given the most and risked the most to keep us uh, safe and healthy uh, during this pandemic. And that includes nurses, frontline healthcare providers, our hospitality workers, which are such a critical part of our local Bloomington economy, uh, and the restaurants and bars that employ them, child care providers and teachers. Um, these are the individuals that House Democrats have put front and center since the beginning of the pandemic, and uh, we're going to continue to do so. Um, and, and you can see that in the priorities we set forth um, in our first 10 bills. And the, the broadly speaking, those cover um, uh, five major areas, uh, economic security, uh, work, uh, worker protections, uh, health care and human services, education and child care. So as, uh, as the session gets started and we start to get uh, into more and more uh, hearing of bills in those committees, uh, these are gonna be these five themes you're gonna hear over and over and over again uh, throughout the course of this, uh, this session. And that's gonna help us uh, uh, get through uh, COVID as well as ensure that um, the Minnesota economy is well positioned um, and, and on a good track uh, moving forward. So I'll stop at that. We can talk more about details, uh, I'm sure, as we get into some of the questions. Uh, real briefly, a little bit about me. Uh, I am the vice chair of state government finance. I also serve on commerce, uh, preventive health, and taxes. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Representative Carlson. Let uh, Senator Franz and your batting cleanup here. Uh, you uh, finish up. Thank you, Robert, and I apologize for the technical upside down, but uh, we were just in another meeting. This is the nature of Zoom. You're back to back on meetings and you have to get on different platforms. So I appreciate your patience with me. But I, uh, State Senator Melissa Franzen, I represent Senate District 49, communities of Edina, Bloomington, Eden Prairie, Minnetonka. This is my third term. So I've been in the Senate for eight years and I am now serving as ranking member for commerce. And I'm also on the finance, full finance committee where you see every single bill dealing with uh, any fiscal implication for the state. Really important this year with the budget being um, determined for the next biennium. And I'm also on healthcare reform with uh, uh, working on, on big issues on healthcare as well. Uh, I'm also the assistant minority leader for my party in the Senate. So I also have that other hat where I'm looking broader and working closer with the administration and with the other body and with all of you to make sure that we um, put our best foot forward. Uh, I will be focused mostly on the budget piece uh, for obvious reasons. And uh, there's a lot of dynamics. We at the federal level have over $26 trillion in debt, as we all know. Um, well, if you don't, now you do. And it's scary uh, because, of course, we want good federal partners, but we're going to have to um, make some serious decisions at the state level. Uh, there's been talk about no um, pledges of no new taxes, which is, um, you know, a, a place of, of, of negotiation. But certainly uh, everything should be on the table and evaluated. Uh, usually where we cut is health and human services and education. About 18 billion part of our dollars, part of our budget is on education. And I have to take my hat off to all the educators and everyone in the field. Uh, during this pandemic who um, have gone through a lot to get our kids back to school. My little five-year-old is going back to school on Monday, so I'm excited about that. I'm also looking into the vaccine rollout, making sure that people have the correct information out there. Um, Minnesotans right now get 60,000 doses of vaccine a week, not enough for the 5 million plus people we have in our state. Uh, and on another side, I'm also a small business owner, and a lot of us have had private practice experience in, in, in corporate America and so forth. So I, I want to take my head off too to all the businesses ha that have done so much to stay open and, and alive during this uh, pandemic. Uh, our last uh, special session on the seventh special session, we had a special session every every month. Uh, we put in $242 million. This is not the first time we put that amount of money uh, to small businesses. That included loans for small businesses, for stages, for unemployment insurance extension, and for counties to also disperse to uh, businesses that didn't qualify directly to the state. And those are really important issues that I think are obviously very pertinent to this discussion today that I, I take very, very personal and very um, deliberate about working 
through every single constituent request that's having issues to keep their businesses open and how we can do uh, our best to to give them to take the red tape out and, and give you a lifeline during this pandemic. So thank you for all the work that you've done. And thank you, Robert, for and the chamber for this discussion. Well, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you guys come. Um, so I will start with uh, some questions from, from the chamber, and then we'll move on to questions from the audience, if that works well. So uh, first question, and this one was given to us by uh, Brent, who's the you know, Bloomington Chamber president, couldn't be here today because he's dealing with a family emergency, unfortunately. But uh, his question for the panel is, you know, the chamber advocates for around, the chamber's advocating for three ongoing areas around regional economic development, workforce, housing, and transit slash transportation. So how do you see session uh, unfolding on those three areas? And maybe I'll just let whoever wants to take a crack at it first, uh, raise their hand and just, and just speak. So that would be, so housing, transit, slash transportation, workforce. And feel yeah. free to be brief. I'll go. So, okay. yeah, I'll, I'll start with the, uh, the, the the transit portion, and uh, I think we'll let, let Representative Howard do the housing part. Uh, but the uh, and tra transit is kind of muddy this year because um, for the short term, um, the uh, CARES Act and the uh, the COVID Act that was passed by Congress in in December. Uh, are both providing uh, quite a bit of money to uh, backfill for the, the fair revenues that uh, our transit operators of, are, are suffering right now. And so it's provided, uh, you know, short-term um, pain relief, but at, at the same time, it's uh, obscuring the, uh, um, the, the longer-term needs. And it's going to make the discussion, um, you know, harder to have when we uh, get into the negotiations about, you know, about long-term transit funding. Uh, and it seems that the, uh, the uh, pandemic has uh, dramatically impacted uh, transit operations, but the impact in, uh, hasn't been uniformly felt. So uh, in a, at least in a relative sense, uh, the, uh, the urban bus rapid transit operations, uh, the local, uh, local transit service, um, the ridership there is, is, is down on, only by uh, about, about half. Uh, and so that at least in a relative sense, um, that, that, that's holding up okay. On the other hand, the, the long haul suburban express services and services like the, uh, the North Star um, and, and the Red Line have been dramatically impacted. So the, the, the composition of the ridership is different. So on the local services, it's more um, need riders, the people who, uh, who have no other alternatives. Whereas on the long haul express services, a, a lot, much larger percentage of the writers are what we call choice writers. They're, they're people who uh, have professional jobs that they're able to work from home. And so on those long haul express services, the ridership is down by 90, 95%. Um, that's also going to uh, you know, complicate the, uh, the, the transit funding discussions because um, <clears throat> very, very, you know, a, a disproportionate share of the, uh, the long haul express services are you know, provided by the uh, the suburban you know opt-out providers, the Southwest Transit, the Minnesota Valley Transit Authority, and the, usually the negotiations about relative funding for local and express service are contentious anyway, and this is just going to make them even even more contentious. So um, it's something that um, uh, that we'll fight very you know strongly for. We want to make sure that the uh, the Orange Line BRT on 35W is completed successfully. We want to make sure that we uh, the, the other um, you know uh, bus rapid transit service uh, lines that are under development that, that will be serving our part of the metro are implemented uh, successfully. Uh, but it, it's it's not going to be an easy easy discussion this year. But we'll be fighting very very hard for it, as as well as you know just making sure that uh, that we end up with enough money to actually execute the plans that are being developed right now for the 35W494 interchange or for the additional lane on 494. So as, as MnDOT is doing those plans, there's not nearly enough money existing to build out those plans completely. So um, we need to make sure that that funding is there. All right, Representative Howard, did you want to go next on that? Sure, I, I can take a crack and I'll focus uh, more so on housing. But first, I just wanted to thank the chamber for these priorities. Um, you know, I think that they really take a broad view of what it 
uh, means for our region and our communities to be strong economically and to focus on areas that really should be, um, you know, points of advantage for our region. Traditionally, things like our educated workforce, uh, our stock of affordable housing, um, and transit opportunities. And so, it to to me, it's a really good. Uh, grounding set of priorities. Specific on housing, um, there's so much we have to do. Um, right in front of us, uh, there's uh, folks that are having trouble affording their rents, affording their homes uh, because of their loss of income, et cetera. Um, thankfully, the federal government has stepped up uh, with a significant amount of housing assistance. That's gonna help uh, support uh, renters. It's also gonna help support landlords. Um, uh, who, who are struggling as well over this last year. And so um, one of our jobs, I think, is to make sure that folks can afford uh, their homes, get caught up if they're behind. Um, and to the extent uh, possible, we want to prevent a wave of evictions uh, after the current eviction moratorium uh, ends, which has been so critical to, uh, to keeping folks in their homes during the pandemic. Um, we also need to do some structural long-term pieces that build on what our communities like Bloomington are trying to do and doing well um, in terms of uh, uh, innovative ways to preserve existing affordable housing and create housing options on the range of uh, the continuum. So I am hoping that we can pass a, a local housing trust fund bill that I've authored the last couple of years that would uh, basically match resources uh, at the local level uh, to, to help communities guide some of this, uh, th their uh, decision making. And then I also believe we really need to put a close eye on preserving naturally occurring affordable housing. I, I admit to be quite concerned that as we saw during the last economic downturn, um, uh, we could see market forces, east and west coast hedge funds coming in, uh, purchasing uh, uh, large uh, apartment complexes and just seeing mass displacement. And so, you know, anytime there's a big disruption in the market, I think we need to be uh, concerned about what the impacts are going to be. Uh, and so I think we need to look at proactive ways to guard against that and to, to protect housing for our communities. And then did somebody want to talk about workforce? Uh, sure, I can, uh, I can touch Representative on that. Helson, thank you. Yeah, so the workforce piece, uh, again, is super critical, uh, not only for um, the businesses, but uh, the workers themselves. Um, as we have seen throughout this whole pandemic is that um, it hasn't affected everybody the same. Uh, there's been a great uh, inequity in terms of how the pandemic has uh, hit different industries and, uh, and, and, and families. So when it comes to workforce, um, you know, we need to um, share in the uh, work to get people back to work. And we can do this together. So um, I have a bill out there that um, focuses uh, on the hospitality industry, well, which was hit incredibly hard by the pandemic and getting those uh, uh, employees back to work. And uh, this kind of right to recall, uh, having them kind of first in line uh, to, uh, to get their old jobs back, uh, I think is uh, well positioned uh, to assist uh, not only the hospitality industry, but those families as well. So uh, let's recover together. Let's let's do this together. Um, to that point, uh, House File Two, I believe it's House File Two, as a broader package uh, that touches on on this as well. So uh, when it comes to uh, worker protections, uh, which is uh, an important. Um, uh, issue for me. Uh, we're going to see uh, bills dealing with uh, emergency uh, paid sick leave and uh, health for healthcare workers, uh, worker compensation for school employees. Uh, we're going to uh, get hospitality workers back to work, as I just described, and expanding unemployment insurance uh, for those collecting Social Security. So those are just some high-level initiatives I think, I think you're going to uh, start to see moving forward uh, here in the near future. So I'm glad to see uh, it's important to the Chamber. It's clearly important, I, I believe, to all of us here in the Bloomington delegation to ensure that our businesses and our, our residents uh, are part of this um, success in moving forward with, um, with uh, revamping our economy. Um, did either of our Senate friends want to answer those questions or or do we should we move on to the next one? I was I was just gonna make one um, comment Go ahead, about Senator. workforce. Um, 
just in terms of the workforce, the uh, child care provider workforce that is so essential to, to allowing more people to be back in, um, in other jobs. Um, we are trying to continue the, the work that was done last year to support child care providers uh, by providing uh, grants to um, all of the different um, family care uh, providers as well as centers to help them with extra costs that they have during the pandemic and the um, loss of revenue from having uh, smaller numbers of, of children in their care um, due to uh, social distancing and you know spacing requirements. They've been they've had their um, out, or numbers reduced. So that's part of it is to keep those grants um, going so that um, providers will stay uh, be able to stay in business. And as things become, um, you know, more back to normal, they can take on more, more kids, but we can't lose these providers in the meantime. And um, additional money will also be going to um, childcare subsidies. So there will be more families um, who have a um, access to a childcare subsidy, uh, which can be, make the difference between um, someone being um, able to, to stay home or, you know, not stay home, but go out, actually go out and seek work. Um, if they have access to subsidized childcare. Sure. sure, I think everything's pretty much been covered. I think the other piece I would add is um, the executive orders, a lot of them have impact on our workforce. Example, and in, in probably near and dear to your heart is telehealth and some things that are using technology to deliver services to people or workforce and making sure they're healthy and safe during this pandemic. So those might be some things that we've learned that could be uh, positive, uh, permanent changes. And, and we're tweaking the way we reimburse these types of uh, services through our healthcare plans and, and other um, services as well. But I just wanna point that out that there's a lot of technology innovation happening right now with workforce working from home uh, and delivering um, all sorts of services in, in a very innovative way. So I think we, I know that government is also looking into and the agencies are looking into how to incorporate that in the workforce of the future and how do we support that? And a big piece of that obviously is broadband too. So um, those are things that are being worked on and we're getting um, quite a bit of federal funding for broadband to Minnesota, making sure that not just uh, greater Minnesota, but everyone who relies on it for our economy to grow. And my children who rely on it for able to do their homework sitting in their bedrooms, right? All right, so let's change gears, although maybe kind of similar. Um, let, let's, uh, let's go to a different question, which is what, um, what actions are you or your caucus taking to address racial disparities? And maybe just pick one or, um, and try and keep your answers to a couple of minutes. And uh, whoever wants to take first time at that, just you can wave at me. Well, I can start with it. I'm part of the Posse Caucus, which it might be the BIPOC Caucus moving forward. But um, we actually have a meeting later today to establish those priorities. Uh, there's everything affects any community, right? Uh, but certainly with this pandemic, we've realized, and someone already alluded to this, that women and people of color are the mostly affected people in lower brackets of the pay scale. And how is that um, going to hurt the economy long term if we continue to have a huge gap in workforce and in disparities in the education? And so those are the things we're looking at. Um, very practical to make sure that we come out of this stronger, not with bigger gaps in our education system and in our workforce. Uh, but more to come on that one because it is a concerted effort and, and our caucus, at least in the Democratic side, uh, really look to the, bipart um, to the BIPOC caucus um, from both House and the Senate. So I'll be following up with you on that one. And can you just briefly say what the BIPOC or Posse caucus are for people who aren't familiar? People of color, indigenous people, and, and, and now it's, uh, yeah, the BIPOC is it's the newest term, um, PC term, I guess. Thank you. Uh, I could go next. Representative uh, Council, thank you. Oh, the, uh, you know, I think this. Sorry, I meant Howard. Yeah, that's right. Um, really, our racial equity gaps should be a lens. We look at really everything we're doing at the legislature. Um, and uh, you know, the speaker, as she's talked about it, you know, it should be something that's baked into the cake. It should really be um, part of how we conduct our work uh, generally. Um, and, and I think that create that's a culture shift and the fact that we have the most diverse legislature uh, in our history is going to help us uh, do a better job of that. Um, 
uh, a couple of specific things. Uh, one of the first bills introduced uh, in the House was the Promise Act to help our communities uh, that were uh, devastated during the unrest after the murder of George Floyd recover. Frankly, I think it's unconscionable that we haven't addressed this already. You know, when usually the culture of the legislature, when there's a flood in some area of the state, when there's, uh, we help we help them because uh, we're in this together, this one Minnesota. And uh, thus far, we haven't responded for our communities uh, of color that were uh, devastated. So that's very important. Um, and then I'll mention, you know, our opportunity gap, our gap in home ownership. Um, those things I think should be front and center um, in part because if you look at sort of the Venn diagram, uh, so, so much of it's interrelated, so they should be front and center. Uh, yes, Representative Howard um, uh, really touched on how we as the uh, House DFL are going to approach our work this session um, by weaving in the, the, the racial equity and the social justice as part of the bills that we introduce. It's going to be uh, part, uh, it's going to be front and center in terms of uh, the work that we do so that uh, we are, you know, and we're going to do that by the testifiers we bring forward and ensuring that we are not leaving anybody out when uh, producing, uh, creating policy for, for Minnesota. And uh, I think with the leadership that we have right now, um, we can rest assured that that will indeed be the case and followed through on. Uh, the Promise Act is a, is a really good example, a comprehensive bill uh, that will address many of these concerns, but this is hard work. And, um, you know, no one's saying it's gonna be easy. Uh, it's, it's, it, it is unfortunate, it is as difficult as it is. Uh, but I think, um, you know, looking at, uh, uh, the work we've done and the commitment that has been restated uh, to move forward in this, that we are committed to ensuring that, uh, again, uh, the racial equity and the social justice is, is part of everything that we do moving forward. Yeah, and for, for my part, I've been trying to think of, you know, specific examples of the, uh, the principles that Representative uh, Howard and uh, Carlson and Senator Franzen have been uh, um, espousing. And I think a good example would be our choices about, you know, which um, bus rapid transit lines to, uh, to fund in, in the bonding proposal last year. So the priorities were the, uh, the B and D line. So the B line is, uh, you know, Marshall Avenue and Lake Street, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Uh, and the D-Line, the one that uh, will start in uh, uh, Northwest Minneapolis, come down through Richfield and end up in, uh, in Southeast Bloomington. Um, so we're, we're putting our, our money where our mouth is in terms of ensuring that the, that the state's investments are also you know, being target on those communities as well. A lot of the work that I'm doing on <laughs> housing affordability is uh, you know, trying to address, um, you know, exclusionary zoning practices that have a, a disproportionate uh, negative impact on the ability of, uh, of people of color to find homes in, uh, in, in, in school districts with good schools, for example. I'm going to uh, cut off there because I think that we've had some good discussion on this and I want to have time to get to questions from the audience too. So first question we have from the audience is about ranked choice voting. I know that a number of you have already signed on to this bill. Um, and I think Senator Wickland might have answered this question in the chat, but for the other two uh, legislators who aren't signed onto this bill, is that something that you're interested in doing or um, it's a specific question? Yeah, I should take that because I'm the lead author of the bill this year and the House was the lead author again last year. And the bill this year um, will once again uh, allow all local governments, including statutory cities, counties, school boards to uh, adopt ranked choice voting for their local elections. Uh, but, you know, building upon the momentum that we gain from uh, the passage of uh, uh, ranked choice voting referendums in Bloomington and Minnetonka this year, uh, we're also, you know, expanding the, the bill this year so that it would call for the state to conduct, uh, use ranked choice voting to conduct all of the elections for all of our statewide office, offices and legislative offices uh, as well. I think we have a critical mass of cities now that are um, going to be demonstrating that um, that the, the ranked choice voting, you know, is simple to implement, uh, effective, and addresses issues uh, you know, like negative campaigning, 
um, third party uh, spoiler candidacies from minor parties, um, you know, creating more, more civil elections. Um, and so we, I, the bill uh, has been introduced in the House, it's House File 89, and we already have about two dozen sponsors on, on that bill and uh, you know, three dozen House members who have signed on to a letter of support in, in um, supporting, supporting the bill as well. And just, um, just, just so I capture the original question, Representative Carlson and Howard, I think they were the question I was asking if you are both supporters of that or if you have other ideas. Or, so maybe yes or no. I'll be really quick. Yes, I want to support it again. And I appreciate the reminder. And literally, as Steve is talking, I'm uh, sending an email uh, to add myself uh, to, to the bill. Um, I will say uh, the, the other in this space, um, there was just a press conference yesterday by Democrats about a bill authored by Representative Emma Greenman to defend and strengthen our democracy. I, I think the events of this month have proved just how vitally important this is. And um, maybe uh, election law and reform uh, will be ratcheted up uh, in terms of its sort of priority in, in the public's mind after uh, what we saw take place. Uh, I'll add quickly. Um, so. Uh, state of finance has broadened its um, jurisdiction, so elections is now part of state of uh, finance. Uh, serving as vice chair, I'm sure uh, we'll be seeing Representative Elkins' bill at some point uh, brought before the committee. Um, so looking forward to that. Obviously, Bloomington now is well-versed uh, in ranked choice voting, uh, having had it uh, as a referendum item this past election. So, um, you know, it's, it's um, educating the rest of the state around uh, the benefits and how it works. So it, it's it's um, it's not necessarily intuitive. I think there is a an education piece behind it and getting uh, the public uh, to support it. So uh, this again, bringing the bill forward, having uh, these uh, types of hearings, I think is is a good step in in uh, educating the public on how ranked choice voting could really help our elections. All right, I have a question uh, from the audience, which is a healthcare question. It looks like only 50% of the vaccine that Minnesota has received has been administered. Does anybody have any, in any insight as to why that why that's going so slowly? I think both, both <laughs> Senator Wicklin and I can add to that. Um, I, I think I mentioned there's 60,000 doses sent to Minnesota on a, on a weekly basis. So we have 5.4 million people in Minnesota um, last count. Uh, and we, that's not nearly enough to, to disperse. So we have a, a, a quantity issue and not a delivery issue at this point. There's certainly ways that um, they're trying to be innovative with the Department of Health and with other uh, private hospitals and organizations and pharmacies and, and setting up programs like the pilot program that was just mentioned or just rolled out this week, uh, which only sets aside 12,000 doses from those 60,000 for child care providers and for teachers and for people 65 and older. So we're starting to see the expansion of, of the folks that are, are going to be able to get the vaccine, but it's gonna trickle in. And we hope that, it, and, and, and what we're getting briefed um, on a weekly basis uh, by the commissioner. And if you have specific questions that you need immediate information, feel free to contact us and we'll get you that information directly from the source. Uh, but that's, um, there's some, some rumors that the vaccine was being warehoused. It's not, not true. There is not enough vaccine to warehouse and we don't have the capacities. It's, it has to be handled very, very um, carefully with um, extreme temperature um, changes and it has to be used within 24 hours and some vaccines are a little different, but it's being, um, as soon as it gets to the state, it's, it's being um, put on people's arms as soon as possible. And, and I believe healthcare providers who are on this panel can actually help us with more information, but I'll pass it on to Senator Wicklin if she wants to add any more. Yeah, I'll just uh, make a comment about the, the vaccine dashboard. Um, that was a recent um, innovation that the Department of Health put together, you know, to get more information transparently to the public about uh, vaccines. And they're still working on um, refining how the data is presented. I think one of the big challenges they're facing is that um, there's a, a reporting period that uh, providers have to, you know, up to, I believe, um, 48 or 72 hours to report administered vaccines. And so anything that um, has been administered, um, it doesn't show up immediately as being administered because of that delay. Um, there's also quite an extensive period of time that um, from the time that um, 
the order can be placed to the time that it actually arrives at a provider. It can take up to, um, from the order placement um, to delivery of the order could be five or six days or even a week. Um, and so it's a challenge for, again, the reporting to catch up with um, where, when providers actually receive their vaccine. <coughs> I know that they are working um, as they get it to get it out into um, into people's farms as quickly as possible, and and we will see that increase um, as we as things go along. So I believe it. You know, it is being used efficiently, and and we just we really desperately need the supply um, to ramp up so that we can we can get even more people vaccinated. All right, I'm going to cut that question off there because I think you adequately answered it. Thank you. Uh, one final question, and then we're going to go to closings, uh, closing uh, thoughts. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that we answered all the questions that were asked by the audience. So uh, one quick question we have here is, you know, uh, we heard a lot of talk about new services we want to offer or programs that we want to initiate. What do you think could be cut from the budget to help offset that? And I will just throw that out to whoever wants to take a step. I can give a, a quick I guess, um, opinion on my end, I sit on finance. And, and as you also know, our state legislature is the only divided legislature in the country. So anything that's going to pass and signed by the governor will have to be bipartisan. And a lot of the things that you might hear might be just elimination of a program and a revamp of, of a new way of, of, of serving people. One that comes to mind is uh, services to people with uh, disabilities, uh, the waiver system's being revamped right now. And, and it might look like a new program, but it's actually making it more efficient. Uh, but there's many examples like that. And I, I, we know there's no appetite for, for new spending, quite frankly, uh, because it, it, we are, are really tight on what we are, our, our expenditures and, 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 and our revenue. And, and we're going to have a deficit in the next biennium if we don't try to fix it now. So, um, and this is the Democrat telling you that. Um, we have to be very cautious and with, with our funding and what we spend and making sure that we um, don't leave people behind and that we put the money to the priorities uh, of healthcare and getting through this pandemic, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I can say I've been serving with uh, Representative Carlson on the state government finance committee. I served on that committee last time as well. And uh, so we know that the, the governor has already directed his, uh, his agencies to cut their administrative headcounts, but it's a tiny fraction of, of the state's budget. The vast majority of the state's uh, general fund budget is spent on education and uh, health and human services. And um, um, it's largely you know, uh, formula funding and uh, it's it's you know, it would really be hard to cut significantly in those areas without you know severely uh, impacting our school districts, colleges, and uh, people who are dependent on the on the state for things like their their nursing homes or their their basic health care. So it's going to be very very difficult to find the you know efficiencies that are, are going to uh, you know help us close this budget gap. Uh, if I can just go next real quick, um, you know, and, and Robert, I, I would uh, maybe rephrase the question is how are we going to balance the budget uh, to just go right to cuts, I, I don't think gets at the at the full picture. So uh, to balance the budget, uh, we also need to consider new revenues. As Representative Howard mentioned earlier on, there are many folks, you know, and as, as you heard from all of us, this pandemic has impacted everybody differently. And there are some that did very, very well. And there, there are some that are still hurting. So we need to look at new revenues as a way in which to balance the budget. Um, and I think, you know, you're hearing from us uh, an open mindset to look at all of these options, but to not even consider new revenues is, is, a, is a, a disservice to Minnesotans. So uh, to look at this comprehensively, um, I believe uh, Senator Franzen mentioned that um, the governor's budget is going to be released next week. Is that Correct. I'm seeing heads nod. So that'll be our first indicator. Uh, we'll have the uh, report come out in February. Uh, so there's a lot of information still to be coming out. Uh, I think it's, you know, obviously it's premature to come up with we're going to do this or that at this point without having all the information before us. But, um, you know, to penalize those that have given the most during this pandemic, our first responders, our teachers, those areas that uh, accommodate the largest part of our state budget to penalize those individuals, that's not fair, that's not just, that's not, 
It's just not Minnesotan. So um, coming in this with uh, a willing to work, to roll up our sleeves, to get the job done, I think we can uh, move forward with an outcome that um, uh, benefits those that have really uh, contributed the most towards uh, dealing with this crisis. I could go next, um, and Representative Carlson uh, stated that really well. Um, I do think we should, we always should look for efficiencies, um, and uh, that'll be an important part of this session. And I'm hoping that we can learn uh, uh, from the pandemic, I mean, in terms of how more folks are working from home, uh, the prevalence of telehealth as an example, and there, there might be some ways we can learn um, uh, going forward that can help us save some resources. But as Representative Elkin said, the reality is um, efficiencies, uh, you, you can't uh, resolve a billion, billion dollars with efficiencies in, in cuts. That there's, there's no way to do that without cuts that harm our schools, harm our most vulnerable. Um, and when I think of areas uh, uh, that we should cut, I kind of look at our tax budget. Uh, it, you know, right now we provide all kinds of benefits uh, in our tax code. Things like we have an exemption, a tax break for folks that purchase gold bullion in our tax code. Uh, folks uh, get a tax break uh, on buying their second home in our tax code. And so I think we gotta look at our tax expenditure budget uh, as a place we can uh, find some efficiencies and uh, uh, some more fairness as well, um, along with sort of just uh, looking at uh, the sort of fairness and budgeting issues that Representative Carlson mentioned. All right, well, we have just a couple of minutes left here for kind of closing thoughts. So um, I want to give everybody a chance to give their closing thoughts very briefly, uh, and then I'll hand it back over to John Paul. So Senator Wickland, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, yeah, and again, thank you for hosting this event so that we have a chance to talk about some of these key issues that uh, people are interested in hearing about. But of course, we can't cover everything. So I hope that people will reach out and contact us, contact me. If you have specific questions that we didn't get answered, I'm happy to answer those. Um, we are working in a different environment. It's a virtual um, world, but um, we are um, accessible by email, by phone. Um, I can make appointments to speak with you, you know, by phone as well. So um, even though we aren't day-to-day uh, -day in our office at the Capitol necessarily, um, we are available and we're working and we can make this um, uh, set up work to, you know, come up with a, a budget that, that um, serves Minnesota well. So I hope that you'll reach out and contact us as you need it. So thanks again. Representative Carlson. Yes, uh, again, thanks to the chamber for hosting us. It's always good uh, uh, to meet with you before and during and after session. Uh, please reach out to all of us um, at any time. Sign up for our e-updates. Uh, email us, call us, uh, let us know what's on your mind. Now more than ever, we need to really hear from folks uh, to you know check in know how, uh, so we can best serve you uh, in the Minnesota legislature. So uh, to quote our presidents, I think we need to build back better. Uh, this is ensuring that all Minnesotans have access to affordable health care, good schools, and economic security, and just making sure that we don't leave anybody out. Um, those are some founding principles of mine, um, and that will lead me uh, in uh, how I conduct my work uh, over the course of, of this legislative session. So um, looking forward to working with the rest of the Bloomington delegation throughout the session, um, and um, Thanks once again for having us here today. Thank you. Uh, Senator Franzen. Thank you very much for having us today. And I, I want to go back to Senator, uh, Representative Howard's thing about the bouillon. That was my bill. So tax cuts are not bad, um, but they have to be prioritized. And right now, maybe that's not the time to give uh, the bouillons a, a tax break, or maybe we, the, a big issue is uh, Social Security. I've, I've supported that to eliminate the taxes on Social Security. But right now we have to make sure that we get through this pandemic, that people are not left behind, that we um, get people vaccinated, that we get this workforce um, back on track and the economy roaring. So that is gonna be the top of mind. And to balance this budget, it's gonna take federal partners and we have to do that in a fiscally responsible way, uh, but also in a moral way that again, we don't make things worse for uh, the people who have already been suffering enough with this pandemic and the workforce shortage and, and the unemployment that we've seen. 
uh, at the lower bracket of the economy. So those are my words. My, I put my cell phone on the line. Please feel free to call me, text me. I'll get back to you. Representative Elkins, briefly. Uh, yes, thank you. I mean, I, my association with the Bloomington Chamber goes back about 20 years. Uh, um, I was the, the city's uh, uh, representative on the chamber board the whole time I was on the on the city council back in the 2000s. So um, carrying a couple of bills for the state chamber th this year is, as well. So I've always been, you know, grateful and appreciative of the uh, the partnership that we all have with the with the chamber. And um, th thank you for giving us this opportunity today and uh, you know, look forward to having a, a, a productive working relationship with the chamber for going forward. All right, and Representative Howard, you get to back clean up. All right, uh, well, thank you all. Uh, as others have mentioned, you know, we could do this for another two hours. Uh, it, it'd be easy to cover so many topics. And so I'm just really grateful for the discussion and uh, we'll enc we encourage folks uh, to, to continue to contact us. And as you're able, if you're working from home, I encourage you to follow the legislature. Um, in some ways, uh, one silver lining uh, is that uh, these virtual committee hearings and sessions has made our process more accessible, or at least in different ways, more accessible to folks. Um, and we have treated that very seriously to try to make sure we can conduct our business, business safely, uh, but with the public able to participate. So, so please continue to do so. Um, we have a lot of work to do and we'll do that best together uh, and just look forward to continuing to work together. Well, I just want to say thank you all so much for your thoughtful words and we really appreciate all five of you being able to join us. And um, so, so once again, uh, very grateful. And with that, I will hand over to John Paul. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Um, John Paul Yates with the Minneapolis Chamber and on behalf of the Minneapolis Chamber and the Bloomington Chamber, Thank you first to Robert for moderating this morning. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for being with us. And special thank you, of course, to our legislators. I know you're extremely busy. Um, so we appreciate your time and your perspective uh, being with us this morning. So thank you. Anna wanted me to mention in our post-event email, we will send out the contact info for our legislators. So you should see that coming to your inbox. And with that, hope everyone has a good Friday and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.